Intubation is a subject that should need no introduction, but if you're not yet familiar with the ordeal, it's probably the most sensitive procedure that a generalist physician has to learn. In short, it's putting a plastic tube into a person's airway to connect him to a breathing machine. Describing it with words is easy, the real thing not so much. First, the stress of it. You only do it in very serious situations. Either because a patient is in respiratory failure and would probably die of shortness of breath if you can't do it in time, or because the patient is so unconscious that they can't reliably maintain their throats open to let them breathe, or keep from letting digestive fluids drip into their lungs, or because you're pretty sure one of the two things is going to happen in short notice. And secondly, visibility is not so great. You're standing behind the patient's head and need to actually see the opening of the trachea to be able to insert the tube in the right place, and not in the esophagus, which is the other opening right behind it. Have you ever seen your vocal cords when you open your mouth in the mirror? No? That's right, it's very well hidden behind all that, and necessarily so. And for some reason, the tube just loves to go into the esophagus. Maybe it's because it has a much wider and softer opening that's also more in line with the opening of the mouth, Perhaps because that's where things are supposed to go after entering your mouth and not into the trachea? Anyways, that's the challenge. I'm not going to describe the step-by-step -step of endotracheal intubation. Other people have already done that. In fact, I strongly recommend that you go ahead and watch one of those videos, either before or after you finish this one. Take a look at the Medscape and UpToDate articles as well. In this video, what I'll do is give you two practical tips that can greatly improve the success rate and the confidence of one's ability to intubate. Not a lot of people are familiar with this, so I think it's worth your time to pay attention. The first thing is the sniffing position. Traditional texts will explain to you with words how you should try to flex the neck or extend the neck here or there, tilt the head, use a cushion, avoid hyperextension or attempt hyperextension. Clearly, that's not the ideal way for you to remember the steps in the moment of heat. Some also give you these diagrams and try to explain to you that you have to align this axis with that axis and show you these lines and arrows. And frankly, the info doesn't come up that easily also when you have a dying patient in front of you. So what can you do? You can let nature be your teacher. Wow! What these diagrams show is that the axes of the mouth, the pharynx and the trachea are not aligned when the head is in a natural position. To have the best chance of intubating, you have to try to place the head in a position where these axes are as close to being in line as possible. Okay, so what is a natural situation when these three axes are put in line? Remember epiglottides? The epiglottis, which is kind of the lid of the larynx, gets swollen and causes trouble breathing because it's preventing the flow of air from the nose and mouth to the trachea. And remember the child always tries to assume a tripod or a sniffing position to try to open it up as much as possible? They're doing exactly what you need to do when you want to align the axes and bring the trachea as much out into the open as possible. Once you have that image on your mind, it's easy to remember the anatomical description of what you're doing and how you actually have to move the patient. You have to do a lower cervical flexion and upper cervical extension. Use a cushion if you have to. Usually it'll go behind the patient's head. But don't get stuck with trying to position the cushion without first thinking of the position of the head that you want to attain. And there you go. Once again, nature shows the way. The second tip I want to give you is bimanual laryngoscopy. What? Which means you use both hands to get a view of the larynx. One holding the laryngoscope like you normally would, and the other to actually move the larynx and place it where it'll best suit your angle of view. Traditional texts will suggest the burp technique, asking an assistant to apply backwards, upwards, and rightwards pressure on the larynx to position it optimally. The arrow direction is inverted here because it's considering the patient's perspective and not yours on the screen. First of all, why rightwards pressure, you ask? Last I checked, our necks weren't crooked to the left or anything. No, but the thing is, when you insert a blade of the laryngoscope, you're supposed to do it from the right side of the tongue, right? Exactly, so that's why you need to push it a little to the right to bring it to your line of sight. But even better is by manual laryngoscopy. After you use your left hand to place the blade in the right spot, use your right hand to move the larynx and try to find the perfect place for that specific patient in that specific position. When you're there, ask your assistant to hold the larynx wherever you're holding it, and then use your free hand to pick up the tube and place it. Clearly, this is more appropriate than assuming that the assistant will just find the place with burp, or perfectly follow verbal redirections from you. <laughs> okay, lastly, a few more quick tips that are often overlooked. The importance of pre-oxygenation. If the patient is able to ventilate on 100% oxygen for a few minutes before you sedate, you're going to have a lot more leeway before he desaturates. 
Some reports mention that a patient can hold a normal saturation without breathing for about 3 minutes if they start off with the lungs full of oxygen. The importance of paralysis. A lot of intubations can go wrong if the patient is insufficiently relaxed. Don't be scared of fully relaxing the patient before you go into his throat. Everything will be softer and it will be much easier to get the larynx in place and to actually push the tube through the vocal folds. The worst that can happen is having to ventilate a patient with a bag mask, having to put in a laryngeal mask, or going for a surgical airway, which could all be needed anyways if you fail to intubate because of insufficient muscle relaxation. Which brings me to the last point. Have a surgical airway as backup for difficult intubations. There are ways to predict difficult intubations, which you can find in the articles I mentioned before, and the technique for getting a surgical airway can also be found on other videos and texts. Just be familiar with the thought that, if you anticipate that the airway could be difficult and has a substantial chance of failure, knowing the basic steps or having the surgeon on call beside you to accompany the intubation for 10 minutes will probably save a life here or there. Okay, that is all. I hope you enjoyed watching this video and that you feel more confident to go out and work in the field and check out the rest of the channel to see if there's anything else you might like and stay tuned to learn more about mysterious and intriguing subjects that you wish were made more clear.